Chemistry, the Central Science, Chapter 3, Chemical Reactions and Reaction Stoichiometry, Lesson 1. So let's revisit the law of conservation of mass, which stated simply that matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Antoine Lavoisier was the scientist who is basically considered to be the man of modern chemistry. So we're moving out of the realm of alchemy and actually how we practice chemistry today. And so within this, it's basically saying that no matter what you start with, so here we're showing the reaction between sulfur and iron to form iron two sulfide, that if we start with 32 grams of sulfur, react it with 56 grams of iron, we have to end up with 88 grams of products. Or if the reaction wasn't complete, if some of the sulfur or some of the iron remained, that that would also be included. So products plus whatever remaining reactants there are still have to equal the mass that you started with. So chemical reactions versus a chemical equation. So your chemical reaction, which we can abbreviate RxN, is actually what happens. What experiment did you do? When you mixed things together, what happened and what products were formed? So we can represent that by using the chemical equation, which we can abbreviate EQN. So your equation then is looking at using the elemental symbols and identifying how many of that particular compound you used as well as their states of matter. So in any chemical reaction, if we were to read this through, we would say ammonia plus hydrochloric acid yields ammonium chloride. We could also make sure that we're stating that it's gaseous ammonia produces gaseous hydrochloric acid and results in a solid ammonium chloride compound. So no matter how we or what reaction we're doing, things are always going to be labeled in the same way, i.e. that your reactants are always on the left side of the arrow and your products are always on the right side. We want to indicate the physical states, and this is important because when we study thermodynamics, we'll see that particular compounds have different amounts of energy based on whether they are a solid, liquid, or a gas. Typically, gases have more energy. They are existing at a higher temperature, um, so they have more kinetic energy associated with them. So we always want to indicate what physical state that we have present. So we look here, little g stands for gas a little S is for solid, we have an L for liquid, and then AQ stands for aqueous, which means that this substance is dissolved in water. So if I read this, it would read gaseous sulfur trioxide reacts with liquid water to form aqueous sulfuric acid. So we have to make sure that we're obeying the law of conservation of mass and that we cannot create atoms, we cannot destroy atoms, what we start with has to be what we end with. And um, all that's happening is a rearrangement of those atoms from reactants to products. So in order to do this, we make sure that we have a balanced chemical equation. So the first thing that we have to start with is making sure that we have the correct formulas for the reactants and the correct formulas for the products. So, Ethane reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. Now here we have an indicated state of matter, but of course we could. So we have to know that ethane, right? Eth means two carbons. The A-N-E ending tells us they are single bonds. So that's where we get the C2H6. Oxygen, we remember, is a diatomic element. It is a molecular element, O2. Carbon dioxide, one carbon, two oxygens and water, H2O. So when I look at this equation, so this is the reaction, this is what happens, but we notice that we have two carbons to start with, only one to end with. We have two oxygens here. We have a total of three oxygens on this side. We have six hydrogens, we only have two. So right now, this is not the correct equation to represent the reaction. So when we start to balance our equations, we cannot change the subscripts because if we change the subscripts, then we change the identity of the particular compound. So we use coefficients, which are numbers that go in front of a particular substance. 
uh, and what you do with that, if we put a two in front of something, then that means we have two of those, or we would multiply all those atoms through by two to see, well, how many total atoms do we have for this particular compound? But once again, we absolutely never change the subscripts and we never put coefficients in the middle of a compound. So for example, I can't shove a number in between the C and the O here to try and balance my oxygen and then put a different number in the front of the C to balance my carbons. So only thing you're allowed to do is put numbers in front of respective compounds. So demonstrated down here, right? We don't change this to C4H12 so that we can balance out a particular number of elements. So we start by balancing the elements that appear in only one reactant and one product. This is just to keep things simple. So in this particular reaction, we see that oxygen shows up in two places. So we're gonna leave that one for last. So that means that we either start with the carbon or the hydrogen, it does not matter. So we see that we have two carbons on the left. We only have one carbon on the right. So that means that we're going to have to multiply our carbon here, our carbon dioxide by two. That then changes at the same time the number of carbons. It also changes the number of oxygen atoms that we have present. But right now we see that we have two carbons on this side, two carbons on this side. So when the number is in the front as a coefficient, it multiplies through the entire compound. When a number is a subscript, it only belongs to the atom that it sits to the right of. So the two here belongs to the carbon, the six here belongs to the hydrogen. So now we count, we have six hydrogens on the left, we only have two hydrogens on the right. So we ask ourselves, what do we multiply two by to get to six? Well, three times two is six. So that means we're gonna put a three in front of our water. So at this point, we've balanced out both our carbons and our hydrogens. And we kind of can, when we go for balancing equations, we kind of bounce around one side of the equation to the other. What did we do here? How does it affect the other substance? So finishing out then, we know that we have to balance out our oxygens. I have two here. I have four from this compound and then three times one, which is three, so I have a total of seven oxygens on the right. So then we once again ask ourselves, what do we multiply by two to get to seven? Well, that is a simple fraction, which would be seven halves. Now we really can't have half of a molecule. So we're gonna actually go through and simplify then our fractions by multiplying the entire equation through by two. That allows us to once again, remove the fraction. So then we end up with two molecules of ethane react with seven molecules of oxygen to form four molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. So we just distribute that, it's math. What you do to one side of the equation, you do to the other. So I multiply everything through by two. And then we can go back and just check to make sure that our balancing is correct. So we just go through and count our atoms. I have two times two carbons, which is four. I have four times one on this side, which is four. I have two times six H's, which is 12. I have six times two H's, which is 12. On this side, I have seven times two, which is 14 oxygens. Then I look at what's happening here. I have four times two, which is eight. And I have six times one, which is six. So I have eight plus six is 14. So this equation then is indeed balanced. This is, that this is the process that you use to balance all chemical reactions, all chemical equations. So looking at um, noted patterns of chemical reactivity, we can identify three common reactions. So the first reaction is a combination reaction and it's doing what it says. We're going to combine two different things to form one new substance. So the easiest way to recognize a combination reaction is that we have two things becoming one thing. A plus B gives us AB. A plus B gives us AAB. Um, here, A plus B gives us AB. So once again, combination says we take two separate things, we bring them together. 
Up here, we're showing the burning of magnesium and oxygen. So we're combusting it and we form a compound called magnesium oxide. Here is how ammonia is formed. We react nitrogen and hydrogen to get ammonia. And this is how we form a dibromopropane. That is what this is over here. So then the opposite of combination reactions are decomposition reactions. So now we have one compound and we are going to split it back into two. We could split it into its respective elements or into two other types of compounds or molecules. So calcium carbonate breaks apart to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Potassium chlorate breaks apart to form potassium chloride and oxygen. Sodium azide breaks apart to form sodium as a solid and nitrogen as a gas. And this is the reaction that is used to inflate airbags so that what you're inflating in the airbag is actually nitrogen, not oxygen, because if you were to get in an accident, we would not want to have oxygen present because then you might blow up. That would be bad. But once again, we're looking at a decomposition, which says I start together, I end separately. So here's like my A, B together, and then I end up with A plus B somehow. So just the opposite of combination. And combination reactions are also simply referred to as synthesis reactions. The last type of reaction to look at with chemical um, patterns of reactivity are combustion reactions. Anytime you have a combustion reaction, the thing that you're going to pay attention to is that oxygen is present as a reactant. That's all that matters. That is what a combustion reaction is. It says, I'm going to take something, I'm going to react it with oxygen. So this can be any type of organic fuel. This is methane, which we can use for a Bunsen burner. Propane, which you might use for your grill. Um, but it also includes different types of metals. We saw the combination reaction between magnesium and oxygen gave us magnesium oxide. Or you can react solid sulfur with oxygen and form sulfur dioxide. So anytime you're burning something, oxygen is present. That is what tells us that we have a combustion reaction. So how do we actually calculate the masses of particular compounds that we have formed or molecules? So we can use these things interchangeably, um, mass and weight, even though we know mass and weight are not the same thing, we can just, we talk about that. So a molecular mass, we can refer to as a molecular weight. So that would be of a molecule. So here we have sulfur dioxide. I have one sulfur atom, two oxygen atoms. So I look at my periodic table and find the atomic mass of sulfur. I find the atomic mass of oxygen. Because I have two of these, I multiply my mass by two, and then I simply add them up. So this is what would be considered the molecular weight of sulfur dioxide. And we always wanna have as many sig figs past the decimal as we can, right? Ionic compounds, because ionic compounds are repeating units of cations and anions, we simply talk about the formula weight. So what is the weight of one of those little units? Sodium chloride, what would that be? So for example, we can look at potassium sulfate or sorry, potassium phosphate. And we have two atoms of potassium, one atom of phosphorus, and four atoms of oxygen. So once again, I refer to the periodic table to find my masses, right? Those are listed underneath the elemental symbol. I have two here, so I multiply the mass by two. I only have one phosphorus, so I don't do anything to this. I have four oxygens, so I multiply by four. I perform the math, I add them up. This is the formula weight for potassium phosphate. So whatever type of compound you're given, you're looking at the subscripts and we multiply them by the mass. If you were to have a compound that had parentheses involved, then you use the distributive property and say whatever subscript is outside of the parentheses, I multiply by what is inside the parentheses and then multiply by the mass. The last thing that we can look at is what we call percent composition of compounds. And this is percent by mass. 
So we can look at the molar mass of an element, which molar mass just says how much, how many grams is that if I have one mole of it? Molar mass, grams per mole. So effectively what we're saying is we know that all these individual masses make up the total mass of our compound. Well, what is the percentage of mass of a particular element in that compound? This is helpful when we want to identify substances, which we'll see uh, following in this chapter, combustion analysis. There's all kinds of compounds that have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. How could we identify one compound from the next? Well, each individual compound has a different percent composition of those particular elements. So the math always goes, whatever my subscript is, N, times the mass that we find in the periodic table, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we divide that by the entire mass of the compound. So what we looked at in the last slide, calculating the formula weight or the molecular weight. So for a particular compound over here, this is ethanol. We have two carbon atoms. We have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens, and we have one oxygen. So to find the percent composition of each of these individual elements, the first thing you wanna do is add up the molecular weight. So two times the mass of carbon, which two times 12.01, plus six times the mass of hydrogen, six times 1.01, .01, so that's 6.06. .06. And then we add in the mass of oxygen, which is 16.00. So that is where this 46.07 grams comes from. So now we just break it down into, well, what did we do with the carbon? It was two times the mass of carbon because that's how many carbon atoms we had. We divide by the overall mass, the molecular weight, multiply by 100. Percentages are always, you're looking at a part of your sample divided by your total sample and multiply by 100. That is a percentage. So then we do the same thing for hydrogen. I have six hydrogen atoms. I multiply by the molar mass divide by the entire molecular weight, multiply by 100% and get 13.13%. I do the same thing for oxygen. I only have one oxygen atom, so I multiply by the um, atomic weight of oxygen, divided then by the entire mass, right, our entire molecular weight, by 100% then, and we get 34.73%. So at the end of the day, when you add up all your percentages for each of your individual compounds, you should get back to as close to 100% as possible within rounding. So if you ended up with say 99.99% or 99.98, that's within you know experimental error or whatever, 100.1%, 100.2. But if you somehow end up with 89% or 105%, Clearly something with the math was wrong.